True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Arena Holdings, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Arena Holdings and its affiliates. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counselling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. Welcome to True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht, and you're listening to a Spotlight Minisode. Before we get into today's Minisode, I'd like to thank our new Patreon supporters for the week. A huge thank you goes out to Grace Irvine and Shanique for signing up to support the show on Patreon. Thank you so much, ladies. It really does make a difference. If you'd like to support the show through Patreon or PayPal, I'll leave the links in the show notes. We also have two new ways to support the show. You can head over to Audible and purchase my first audiobook production of Jana Marx's book, The Krugersdorp Cult Killings. Or you can also get a 10% discount and support the show at the same time by using the code TCSA10 on the online store King Online, where you can get all of your health and beauty needs. As always, any form of support is greatly appreciated, and it doesn't have to be financial. Sharing of episodes, inviting your friends and family to listen, and interacting on social media all go a long way to help keep the show growing and improving. In Spotlight Minisodes, I discuss cases that are in the media at the moment, and this week's cases range from tragic to terrifying. The first case is one that has spanned 11 years, and Tanya Schroeder, wife of murdered Jeffreys Bay businessman Klaus Schroeder, has never let up in her fight for justice for her husband. The unusual and tragic thing about this case is that Klaus's body has never been found. Tanya has never been able to lay him to rest, but the state was convinced enough by the evidence that a judge recently found two people guilty of his murder. The complex trial would span 182 days, and the state would call 60 witnesses in its fight to prove the guilt of Jens Leonberg and his partner, Christina Adler. The story begins when businessman Klaus Schroeder disappeared on the 14th of August 2009. In the investigation into Klaus's disappearance, Police, of course, looked into his business connections and background in a bid to find a reason that the man may have vanished. This was when police started looking into a German couple who Tanya had said had been set to purchase a property from Klaus in the days before he went missing. Police soon discovered that Jens Leonberg and his girlfriend Christina Adler were certainly not the multi-millionaires that they pretended to be. In fact, since the couple had arrived in South Africa from Germany in 2007, they had appeared to have left a trail of fraudulent transactions, totaling close to 56 million rand. Christina Adler would claim that she had no idea that Leonberg was not who he claimed to be, and that she had simply been along for the ride, believing that her boyfriend was a multi-millionaire, and he gave her the lifestyle that seemed to prove this. Police would come to realise that Klaus Schroeder must have discovered exactly what they had before his disappearance, or at the very least, he discovered that the documents that had accompanied Leonberg's offer to purchase were fraudulent. It's believed that on the day of his disappearance, Klaus had gone to confront the couple, who then killed him and disposed of his body. Blood found in the couple's vehicle, witness testimony and documentary evidence 
would be enough to prove that the scenario was indeed the most likely. Unfortunately for Klaus's family, justice would not be swift, as Jens would be on the run for two years before handing himself over, and then delay after delay would result in more than a decade of waiting until the trial eventually started, and then another 182 days before a result was eventually forthcoming. Both parties still claim that they are innocent, and have never revealed the location of Klaus's body. It is possible that they may use this information to attempt a reduction in sentence in the sentencing phase, which will take place in April. I somehow doubt that they will, though, as this would impact any appeals that they may have available to them. This case is not the first no-body conviction in South Africa, but it is the first of its kind in Port Elizabeth. Also in Port Elizabeth, another case recently played out in court, which underpins the importance of DNA and fingerprinting systems to solving cases. In May 2018, 86-year-old Anne Smith was confronted by two intruders in her home. The men, who would later be identified as 20-year-old Junior Lungisa and 28-year-old Sizwe Jika, had ransacked Smith's home and then brutally beaten the elderly woman, who later died in hospital. The men were arrested within three months of the crime, taken to trial, found guilty, and each sentenced to 25 years in prison. This would not be the end of the story, though, at least not for Sizwe Jika. Police were still investigating two other murders, which had taken place within close succession of Anne Smith's murder. The first was that of 26-year-old mother, Kelly Bain. Kelly had recently given birth to her first child, and was at home on maternity leave one afternoon when she was attacked by an assailant in her home. After having locked Kelly's domestic worker in the bathroom, Kelly was brutally murdered while her son slept in the next room, and then her killer took his time ransacking her home. The man was surprised, though, by Kelly's partner coming home for lunch, the two men wrestled, and the assailant managed to escape. While Port Elizabeth was still grappling with the horrific death of Kelly Bain, another body was found. Anne Ferreira was 83 years old when she was found brutally raped and murdered in her home. It was clear that her home had also been ransacked. Shortly after Sizwejika was sentenced for the murder of Anne Smith, DNA and fingerprints would prove that he had been responsible for the murders of Kelly Bain and Anne Ferreira as well. He was charged and brought to trial for both cases. At the end of February this year, Jika was given his third life sentence for the murder of Ferreira. He had also received a life sentence for Kelly's murder. It would emerge that Sizwe Jika had been a criminal from the age of 10. He had committed hundreds of house robberies in the Port Elizabeth area and surrounds in his lifetime, and police have not ruled out the possibility that there may be more murders that he's been responsible for. It would seem unlikely to me that he'd graduated to murder only in the last three months of his freedom. I would definitely like to do a deeper dive into this case at some point, as I think there is a lot more to be learned here. The last case I want to discuss today is a bit of a different one, but no less tragic at its senseless loss of life. I first heard about the case on carte blanche when the program was looking into the circumstances surrounding the death of 28-year-old Marie Huern and 25-year-old Jean Forsluer. The couple had gone on holiday to a guest farm in Corriedo with a friend. 
on the morning after their arrival when the friend was unable to get their attention, he found the couple deceased in the bathroom of their chalet. Neither one had any visible injuries to their body, but both had clearly been showering or getting ready to shower when they died. The untimely death of the couple devastated their families, and of course, they needed to know what had happened. Unfortunately, it would take a full year for the toxicology reports to come back from our labs to confirm what everyone had started to suspect. The couple had died from carbon monoxide poisoning. In the carte blanche episode I watched, the team exposed how the gas geyser in the shower of the couple's chalet appeared to have been installed incorrectly. In the weeks after Marie and Jean's deaths became public, three other couples would come forward to report having had near-death experiences in the same chalet at the guest farm. The couples reported becoming violently ill and experiencing near blackouts. Thankfully for them, they survived. Marie and Jean were not so lucky. Now, a year later, with the toxicology report having confirmed their cause of death, police have stated that a criminal investigation has been started around two cases of culpable homicide. When Carte Blanche covered the case, they alluded to the fact that someone linked to the guest farm may have knowingly used substandard installation methods. In South Africa, any gas installation must comply with the Health and Safety Act of 1993. A certificate of conformity must be issued for the installation, and this can only be done by an individual that is registered with the Liquefied Petroleum Gas Safety Association of South Africa. What is important, though, is that the onus remains on the property owner to ensure that the installation is carried out according to these regulations. So, in this case, if it is indeed found that the property owner or someone acting on his behalf did not do due diligence in ensuring the installation was safe, he or she may well be responsible for these two deaths, even if the installer misrepresented themselves as being qualified to do the job. Considering the fact that there are allegedly three other couples who've had similar near-death experiences at the location, if it is further found that not only was due diligence not done, but also that the property owner knew that there was an issue and failed to do anything about it, this may well increase the severity of either the charges or the sentence issued if someone is found guilty. If you're a property owner and have gas installations in your home, I want you to think about this. Not only for your own safety and that of your family, but also any visitors to your home. If you rent out your home, as the landlord, you remain responsible for the proper operation of gas utilities. It is not worth cutting corners in gas installations to save a buck. And of course, we don't yet know what happened here, but in general, it definitely does happen. If you've purchased a home, don't just accept that the gas certificate you're given is compliant. Do your own homework and make sure that the installer is registered and that the installation is safe. Yes, it costs a bit of money, but there is simply no comparison with the cost of a life, and the possibility of jail time and a criminal record if your decisions result in senseless loss of life. Marie and Jean were due to get married this month. They had met while at university and been living together for three years when they died. Sadly, now instead of celebrating their marriage, their families are only one year into what will likely be a frustrating investigation, and we can only hope that it will end in justice for the pair. 
And that is your Spotlight Minisode for the week. If you enjoyed this Minisode, please be sure to subscribe to the show on the app you're using to listen right now. Before I go, I've got a promo for you for a true crime podcast I highly recommend. I'll leave the link in the show notes as well. This is Brew Crime, a craft beer and true crime podcast. I'm Mike. I'm Beck. And I'm Nina. And we're your hosts. We pair a true crime story with a craft beer. That Nina will probably hate. Yeah, probably. Whatever. You can find our show on all your favorite podcast apps, and if you can't find it, contact us, and we'll try and change that. We can be found at brewcrime.com or on all social media platforms at Brew Crime. As well, you can find us on our Facebook group at Brew Crime The Group. Join us as we discuss the horrible crimes that surround us and try not to giggle. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'll be back next Friday with a full case episode. Until then, as always, thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon.